this vivid memory of being 13 years old in confirmation class. And this was in Orlando at St. John Vianney Catholic Church. And one day, this young adult came to visit our confirmation class and share her story about a mission trip from which she had just returned. You see, the Diocese of Orlando has adopted the poorest region in the Dominican Republic, San Juan de la Maguana, as a sister diocese. And she showed us this picture of a little boy like we've all seen in many pictures of this naked, dirty little boy with a protruded belly. But in that moment, I learned that his belly and the belly of other children were swollen, not because they were full of food, but full of parasites. And that other children in these villages were blonde, not because they were genetically blonde, but because they were so malnourished that their little bodies could not pigment their hair. And in that moment, I looked at that picture and I knew one day I want to do that. I want to be with those children. But I was 13. So I kind of just went back to my regular 13 year old life. But fast forward 12 years and a different young woman showed up at my parish and she said, hey, we're raising money for the sister diocese and by the way, we're looking for youth and young adults to go on a 10 day mission trip. We're looking for 16 to 25 year olds. Now I was 25, so I said, I need to go now because if this lady comes back next year, I will be too old. And so I did. I went to the Dominican Republic for 10 days and we helped build a school in a little town called Los Guayuyos. And I fell in love. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the town, even though they had no electricity, no running water, and no paved roads. And I won't lie to you, when I came back from my mission trip, I literally hugged my toilet because doing the latrine thing for 10 days was a really new experience. But I did come back and tell my husband, babe, guess what? We're moving to the Dominican Republic. And like all good Catholic supportive husbands, he said, you've lost your mind. We're not doing that. But actually, a couple of years later, he had his own mission experience, went to the same villages, and he felt what I felt. And he heard what I heard. And we did make a decision to move long term to the Dominican Republic. Now, when I got there, I had this crazy idea that I was the superhero, right? In my head, I even had this invisible superhero cape on my back, right? Like, dun, 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 I have arrived. You will never be the same because I am here. Your community will never be the same because I have arrived. But I was wrong. The reality is, is that with the mission office, we did a lot of good work, potable water projects and education projects. We helped people get their birth certificates because they didn't even exist in the eyes of their government at that time. We helped build schools, we helped build houses, but at the end of it all, I learned so much more from them than they did from me. And one of the greatest lessons that I learned from that experience came from when our education project partnered with the Dominican government. Now, I was skeptical about this at first because the Dominican government has a great reputation of being really corrupt. But really, this partnership opened up so many opportunities that didn't exist before. All of a sudden, these little schoolhouses that we had helped build were recognized by the government. All of a sudden, they were helping provide free breakfast and free lunches for the students because we know that children have a harder time learning when they're hungry. All of a sudden, our little boys and girls were competing at a national level and winning some of these awards. And so the lesson that I learned is that there is such an important need to do work in the public policy space in addition to the charity work that we do. And I realized that it wasn't just me that thought this way, right? That had this wonderful kind of realization. The Catholic Church has been saying just this for, I don't know, 130 years, right? For all of modern Catholic social thought. 
Catholic social teaching from the beginning, popes have been telling us just this. So Rerum Novarum, 1891, Pope Leo XIII is kind of looked at as the foundational document of Catholic social teaching. And it's all about the conditions of, of laborers, of workers, just wages, and the role of the government in ensuring that. Pope Francis in 2013 um, said in the homily that good Catholics meddle in politics. In his first encyclical, Pope Francis said that politics is one of the highest forms of charity in as much as it seeks the common good. And popes before him have said this, the bishops have said this, even the catechism says this that we are called to walk on this pilgrimage of love on the two feet of justice and charity. So I think about charity as the band-aid that we put on someone when they're bleeding. And it's important to put that band-aid and it's important to stop the bleeding, but in order to heal the whole person, we have to get to the root as to why this person is wounded. Why is this person bleeding? And that's the, the justice piece. So in Matthew 25, we hear that we are to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, and clothe the naked, and visit the imprisoned. But we are also called to address the root causes of why people are hungry, and why people are thirsty, and why are they naked, and why are they imprisoned. And that is the work of justice. You see, we need to both volunteer at the homeless shelter and advocate for access to affordable housing. We need to both walk with women in unplanned pregnancies and volunteer and donate um, with crisis pregnancy centers while we also advocate for the legal protection of the unborn. We welcome the migrant in our churches and in our communities while we advocate to address the root causes of migration in sending countries. Root causes such as civil unrest and such extreme poverty that their children have those protruded bellies and their babies are malnourished. Little did I know that working in this remote village in the Dominican Republic close to the Haiti border would prepare me to lobby in Tallahassee, but it did. So I've had the honor and the privilege of working for the Florida Conference of Catholic Bishops for seven years now. We've been around for 50 years and we are the public policy voice of the eight Catholic bishops of Florida. And not everyone believes me when I say we're nonpartisan, but I promise you, we really mean it. You see, at the same time as we advocate for the unborn, we also advocate for an end to the use of the death penalty and a protection of migrants, a protection of the environment, criminal justice reform, racial justice, parental empowerment and education, and access to health care, among many issues and concerns. And I'll tell you, the number one comment that I hear at the state legislature from members of both parties is, you know, I don't agree with you on X issue, pick your issue, there are lots from which to choose, but I don't agree with you on X issue, but I do admire your consistency. And there's something really beautiful in that, that not many people look at public policy the way we Catholics do, which is that seeking the common good actually transcends partisanship. And it's not just me that's called to do this work at the Catholic conferences. All of us are called to do this work. I'll give you a couple of good reasons. Number one, we here in the United States have such a privilege to be involved in the political process without fearing for our lives. I think that other little girls probably went to bed hearing fairy tales about, you know, Snow White and Cinderella. Um, I was put to bed by my grandmother and my great aunt with stories about 
communism. Um, and, and some of them were really sweet stories about their parents who apparently never fought and about these, you know, young women walking on the beach on the boardwalk of uh, Cuba, El Malecón. And some of them were horrendous. Some of their stories were about food rations and forced labor camps and my grandmother being pulled into an office by communist soldiers and told, if you do not denounce your Catholicism, you will lose your job. And she lost her job as a high school principal. Stories about my father and my grandfather being captured and tortured and imprisoned for 14 years and 20 years for fighting the Castro regime. And even though I've chosen the traditional fairy tales with my own children, I'm so grateful that I was raised hearing these stories because it gave me just such a respect for the democratic process and such an appreciation to be able to be part of the political process without fearing for our lives. Another great reason for us Florida Catholics to be involved in the political process is that Florida's a national outlier in so many horrible ways. So we have some of the highest rates of human trafficking. We have some of the highest numbers of abortion. 71,914 babies were aborted just in Florida and just last year. I'll let you sit with that for a minute. 71,914 of our babies were aborted just last year and just in our state. We have some of the highest numbers of death sentences, of executions, of death row population, and of exonerees. 30 men have been released from Florida's death row for innocence, far more than any other state. We have some of the highest rates of homelessness. Over 28,000 people live in a shelter or on the streets. We have some of the highest numbers of incarceration. About 90,000 people are behind bars in our state today. And I hear from people all the time that say, yeah, but it's just because we're such a populous state. And I hear you, but we can't be complacent with that response. You see, we as Catholics are called to build a culture of life in our society. And life meaning womb to tomb pro-life for the whole life. As the bishops have said, all the life issues are interconnected. They're all related. For erosion of respect for one stage of life means erosion of respect for all stages of life. So we as Catholics can reimagine, reinvent, rebuild our society through that lens of Catholicism, one that doesn't just seek for abortion to be illegal, but for abortion to be unthinkable. Of the babies that were aborted last year, the majority of mothers reported that the reason they got an abortion was for economic reasons. Why is that a thing? And how can we eliminate that as a thing? How can we build a society with support systems so that women aren't pit up against their own children? How can we create a society that no longer demands the labor of children, the sex trafficking of children, or of adults through force, fraud, or coercion? How do we build a society that doesn't judge people by the worst thing they've done in their lives? I wouldn't want to be judged for the worst thing I've done in my life. And just lock them in a cage and throw away the key. What would happen if we actually invested in the rehabilitation 
knowing that so many people who find themselves incarcerated have a history of trauma, of neglect, of abuse, and of mental health issues. And what if we looked at addiction as a mental health issue and not as a crime? Our parishes, our dioceses do such really great work with life ministries and social justice ministries and prison ministries, such good and necessary work. But an important component in all of this is political advocacy. Because influencing legislation has a real impact on real human beings. It can change lives. It can save lives. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's easy, because it's not. There's this great term about us Catholics being politically homeless. And I think that really captures it because we don't fit into either major party box very well. One party gets it right on some things and the other party gets it right on some others. So how do we vote? How do we participate? The truth is, is that there are no perfect candidates and there is no perfect party. And the bishops are not gonna make it easy for you because they're not gonna endorse any candidates and they're not gonna endorse any party. And they're not gonna tell you that only one issue matters. Catholics are not single issue voters. The bishops do say that abortion is a preeminent issue, but we cannot dismiss and we cannot ignore the other attacks on human dignity, such as poverty, and racism, and harming the environment, and the death penalty. So what do we do? The guidance from the bishops is to know the issues, and then to know where the candidates stand on those issues, and then prayerfully participate in the process. Now, our office attempts to help you through this um, process by a candidate questionnaire. So um, on every uh, election year, we have a candidate questionnaire. We send a series of questions to everyone in Florida who's running for U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, Florida uh, Senate, and Florida House. And by no means is this list exhaustive, but it is a good snapshot of where candidates stand on these issues and you can find those on our website. We also have a presidential comparison. We collaborate with other state Catholic conferences on this, where we, again, compare the two presidential candidates from the two major parties. Again, not an exhaustive list of every issue of concern to the church, but a good snapshot. And on the presidential comparison, um, the information that you'll find is pulled from their campaign websites um, and from actions that they've taken while in office. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops also has great resources. So one is the Civilize It campaign. Um, there are images that you can use on your personal social media. There are resources you can use with your ministries. And it's a great reminder that we can disagree without being disagreeable. We can have different ideas about how to engage in the political process without tearing each other down. And if you're interested in a little bit uh, more reading, a little deeper reading, um, I do invite you to read um, the Bishop's document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. Now, I do invite you and encourage you to vote this November, but it doesn't end there. In many ways, it just begins there because it's important that we educate members of both parties about the pro-life for whole life perspective. It doesn't really matter who wins what seat. There is always more work to do. So I do invite you to um, sign up for our electronic network at the Catholic Conference. If you're not a member yet, the website is FLACCB. Dot org. We will send you newsletters updating you about the different issues that we're watching, and we even invite you to participate 
in contacting your member. So for example, anytime a death warrant is signed, you will get an email asking you to contact the governor and ask him to commute that death sentence to a life sentence and stop signing death warrants. As bills move through the legislative process, we will ask you to contact your member and let them know if the Catholic Church supports or opposes that issue. You can also participate in our annual Catholic Days at the Capitol, where hundreds of Catholics from around the state come to Tallahassee and lobby their members on um, a couple of issues of priority. Again, not the exhaustive list. Um, and part of Catholic Days is also the annual Red Mass, where we invite members of the legislature, um, justices from the state Supreme Court, and members from the, the cabinet to come pray with us and the eight Catholic bishops of Florida. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know what that's gonna look like in 2021 due to COVID, but stay tuned. And so I'll leave you with this. When my 10 year old fifth grader is having a really hard time with an assignment, I tell him, Levi, I don't care if you get it right. I care that you try. And so I'll tell you similarly, that it can be very, very challenging to figure out how to get this public policy thing right through the Catholic perspective when we're faced with two imperfect parties. But what does matter is that you get into the arena and do your best forming your consciences for faithful citizenship. Brothers and sisters, thank you for your time today. And together, let us walk on this pilgrimage of love, walking on the two feet of justice and charity.